So you're at the stage where you're finishing up your research on or maybe even purchasing your first astrophotography setup. You're super excited, you've got all the gear laid out and ready to go, and then you realize, what is there even to take a picture of right now? Before you actually begin taking photos of the night sky, it's important to get an understanding of how it works and what the seasons are for astrophotography. Being able to understand which targets will be visible in the sky at each time of the year will be super helpful in your planning for the future of your astrophotography journey. So hopefully this video will be able to help you learn a little bit about that and you can use it as a guide for your future images. I'm gonna go over why the changes in the night sky happen as well as what targets you can image at each point in the year. Really quick before we jump into things, I wanna make a fast disclaimer that this video's targets that are mentioned will only apply to people who are imaging from the Northern Hemisphere. As lucky as you guys are down there in Australia with your targets, I'm only gonna cover the ones on the other side of the planet. Of course, the concept of why the skies change and what happens is still the same, but the targets mentioned for each time of year is gonna be completely different for you guys down in the Southern Hemisphere. So without further ado, let's get started. So the first sort of overarching concept you want to get an understanding of before we go into anything else is the fact that the Earth does a little more than a full rotation every 24 hours. The time it takes the Earth to do a full rotation is 23 hours and 56 minutes. So in the 24 hour mark when the day resets, the stars are actually four minutes ahead of where they were the day before. It's a little bit confusing to think about, but think about it this way. Let's say you went outside on May 27th and took a picture of the night sky at exactly 10 p.m. If you were to go outside the next day on the 28th and take a picture of the stars, if you wanted them to be in the exact same position they were the night before in that picture, you would have to take the picture four minutes earlier at 9.56. If you took the picture at 10 o'clock on the 28th, the stars would be a little bit further rotated than they were the night before. Now, this four minute difference each night doesn't seem like a big deal at first. I mean, what's four minutes gonna do? But once you start looking at the bigger picture over a long period of time, it starts to become a big deal. Over time with each night, as the stars rotate more and more and more, the night skies begin to shift and new constellations become visible as the seasons progress. It so happens to be that this is an annual cycle. So the constellations you'll see on each day of the year will be the exact same constellations the next Next year. So the Big Dipper on May 27th, 2024 is going to be in the exact same spot on May 27th, 2025. Now I'm throwing a lot of words at you. If this doesn't make sense at first, it will as we go on and talk about some sort of real world scenarios here. So like I said, the schedule that the deep sky targets follow is consistent and annual, unlike the planets which vary from year to year. So this results in different areas of the night sky being visible at different times of year, like we've already said. And from our perspective on Earth, depending on where you look in the night sky, the targets that you'll be able to see through a telescope can differ. There's an area of the night sky where you're looking into the core of our Milky Way galaxy. So if you're pointed that way with your telescope, you'll see a lot of big, bright red nebulae because you're looking into our galaxy. However, if you were to point at the opposite direction far away, you're looking outwards from the core of our galaxy into the blackness of space. So the amount of nebulae you would see would be a lot less, and in comparison, the amount of galaxies you'd be able to see way far off into the distance would be a lot greater. It all depends on where you're looking. And since we've established that the different sections of the night sky are visible from our perspective at different times of year, that can lead to clusters of targets being being visible at one single point. So it's not always equal. So now I'm gonna go through the different seasons of astrophotography and tell you guys which months are best to view which targets. So first up we have the early winter months. In this context, I'll be talking specifically about January and February. The exact position of the targets in the night sky will vary depending on your latitude, but as long as you're in the Northern Hemisphere, it'll be about the same. January and February are dedicated towards nebulae. 
It's not quite nebula season, as that'll be apparent later on in the year, but I like to call it the winter nebula season. There are some pretty prominent targets to go after at this time of year. There's the famous Orion Nebula, which is the brightest nebula you can see from the Northern Hemisphere. It actually looks like a star visible with your naked eye. That's how bright it is. A little bit upwards and to the left from the Orion Nebula, you have the Horsehead and Flame Nebula, which is another super famous target. You also have targets such as the Tadpoles Nebula and the Witch's Broom and the Rosette Nebula. Some of these targets I've actually photographed already on the channel before, so you can go back and watch those videos if you want. But you will never see a video of a Northern Hemisphere astrophotographer photographing the Rosette Nebula in August. Springtime has a nickname throughout the astrophotography community. If you are familiar with astrophotography or astronomy to any degree, you know exactly the next words that are going to come out of my mouth. If you're going to pick one section of the year to deem a season based off of the astrophotography targets, you're going to pick spring. The nickname for spring is, say it with me, galaxy season. It just so happens to be that the northern hemisphere is positioned exactly away from the core of the Milky Way galaxy, so you're getting the brunt of all of these distant, bright galaxies from your backyard. Galaxies are pretty much the opposite of nebulae in terms of how you photograph them. For nebulae, they're really big and really bright, and galaxies are dim and usually pretty small. So the type of telescope you're going to use is going to be completely different. You're going to want to bust out the biggest telescope that you have, and you can't use the same light pollution filters for nebulae with galaxies. The narrow band light pollution filter you were using to photograph the Rosette Nebula is not going to result in really anything for the Whirlpool galaxy unfortunately. You're gonna have to switch to a broadband light pollution filter. So this is why galaxy season tends to be my least favorite time of year for astrophotography as the setup that I have is not built to photograph galaxies whatsoever. I got a small telescope in a light polluted area and it just doesn't work out very well. But yeah the months from March until Halfway through May, about, are, is filled with galaxies. That's all you're gonna be able to photograph. And when I say there's no nebula in the night sky, I mean it. There's probably one target that you're able to photograph that's a nebula, and it's the Cat's Eye Nebula, which is shaped like a galaxy anyways. So if you wanna photograph any nebulae, you're gonna have to stay up into the really early morning hours towards the end of the season to get some of the early Milky Way targets. But as May rolls around and the month starts to progress, and the galaxies start to set on the horizon earlier and earlier, Earlier, things get a little exciting. Depending on how early you want to start and how excited you get, the end of May into June is the start of the nebulae season. For the Northern Hemisphere imagers, this is when the Milky Way core rises above the horizon, aka the concentrated spot of the night sky with the most nebulae. But it's not just in there either. There's plenty of other targets such as the Dumbbell Nebula and the Veil Nebula and the Seder region, the Butterfly Nebula that you can photograph all in the months of end of May, June, July, August, even into September. September. This is when you're going to want to use your smaller telescopes. And conveniently, nebula season is starting right now at the time I'm posting this video. So if your wide field telescope just came in the mail, you're in luck. This is also a great time to go out with your camera lens and maybe even a star tracker and photograph the Milky Way wide field. If you look up Milky Way on Google, you're going to see these bright cloud bands of stars arcing across the sky from professional photographers. And that is what you might be able to see if you go outside in a dark sky sight in the months of the summer. This is widely considered to be most astrophotographers' favorite season, and you can definitely see why. The warm nights mixed with the great targets make for a great experience. But it doesn't stop there. There's more targets to come. Oddly enough, there's not much said online about the actual fall season for astrophotography. It's kind of a mishmash of everything. Uh, there are some people who are imaging the last of what they can get from the summer targets, and there are some people that are already staying up late to get the winter targets. But in general, the months of the end of September all the way through October into the early weeks of November are typically divided into a couple targets, the biggest of which is, is probably uh, the nebulae in Cassiopeia, uh, such as the Pac-Man Nebula 
and the, uh, the Bubble Nebula, as well as the Bright Elephant's Trunk Nebula, which you saw me image last year. I typically label September and October as a sort of miscellaneous time of year where you can just image anything you really want. But probably the biggest and brightest target that's visible during these months from the Northern Hemisphere is the Elephant's Trunk Nebula. And then you have November. I like to classify November as its own season for astrophotography. Um, there's two targets particularly that are pretty unique for this time of year that you can really image uh, to the maximum capacity in November. Of course, keep in mind that the targets from the earlier seasons, uh, even stretching as far back as uh, the summer, are still visible early on in the night in November, but you typically would be done with those targets by now if you're imaging for most of the year. November is such a unique time for astrophotography. The, the end of fall, early winter season and I've mentioned this before, is my favorite season for astrophotography. Um, it just gets so quiet and peaceful and I really love it. Uh, and there's still a ton of great options. You can stay up late and get the winter targets such as Orion or you can image the summer ones like I've said. But the two biggest targets that most of the astrophotography community is going to be posting on Instagram is the Andromeda Galaxy and the Triangulum Galaxy. These are two enormous galaxies visible from Earth, not just because of their actual size, but specifically to their proximity to Earth. The Andromeda Galaxy and the Triangulum Galaxy are the two furthest things you can see with your naked eye. If you go to a dark sky site and you look up in their direction, you'll see a faint patch of fuzziness, and you're looking at the furthest thing you will ever look at. The Andromeda Galaxy can't really be imaged with a telescope. It would have to be with a really wide field telescope that's basically just a camera lens at that point. I've never uploaded a video of me imaging the Andromeda Galaxy just because I haven't gotten the chance these past few years. It was really cloudy this past November and I only got one video out. Another strategy you can use which is pretty advanced for the Andromeda Galaxy is to do a mosaic where you can image different sections of it individually and then piece that together too. And that leads us back all the way to where we started, the months of December. December, January, and February. I really hope this video was useful for you. If you were unsure about the seasons for astrophotography and what was visible when, hopefully you can sort of put this video into context with some other videos you've seen. Maybe you saw a video of someone imaging the Veil Nebula and you think, oh, um, that was in August. That makes sense. And hopefully that can get you excited for some future targets that you'll be able to image with your telescope. I've saved chapters in this video below for each of the seasons, so if you want to come back and watch this video at different times of the year and fast forward to the time that you're imaging at, feel free to do that. And if you guys were wondering about the situation with my setup, my mount is still broken. I couldn't figure out a way to fix it, uh, but the Skywatcher EQ6R Pro is on the way, so I'm so excited to get testing with that. So with that being said, I am super excited to get imaging within these next couple weeks. I got big things coming, some trips coming up. I think you guys are really going to like uh, some videos in the future, and I can't wait to see where we go from here. So with that being said, I wish you all the best, and on top of that, I wish you some nice, dark, clear skies.